Hello, this is Dr. Paul Finger, Director of the New York Eye Cancer Center and Specialist in Ocular Tumor, Orbital Disease, and Ophthalmic Radiation Therapy. Today I'd like to share my expertise in how to predict, prevent, and treat radiation retinopathy. First, let's define what is radiation retinopathy. Well, it is an occlusive vasculopathy. That means radiation will cause blood vessels to close over time. It starts at the time of treatment and is progressive. It does not stop until the tissue is scarred and no longer able to react. It's dose dependent. Therefore, the amount of radiation will affect either the onset or the severity of radiation retinopathy. A more detailed description of the pathophysiology of radiation retinopathy and optic neuropathy is beyond the scope of this lecture. Therefore, I have added several references, two of which are mine, but the original reference by Archer describes the clinical histopathologic and ultrastructural and even experimental correlations of radiation retinopathy. For those of us in clinical practice, we use different methods of radiation to treat eye tumors. These include beta emitters, gamma emitters, and charged particles. Each has its own unique characteristics with respect to intraocular dose. So radiation retinopathy is dose dependent also is based on the type of radiation you use. And I bring up these three sources of plaque therapy, ruthenium-106, iodine-125, and palladium-103, because they're different. Ruthenium is a beta, beta emitter, which gives off its radiation very close to the plaque, and so there's generally a higher dose right at the surface, which is the sclera, the choroid, and the retina as compared to iodine and palladium, which are low-energy gamma emitters, and they tend to give off less radiation at the base for the same amount of radiation at the apex. However, since the iodine and palladium radiation can go farther into the eye, it's often used to treat taller tumors. And when that happens, the dose to the base and apex becomes different. And there's a dose gradient where the base can get quite a bit of radiation in treatment of those tall tumors. This is what radiation retinopathy looks like. Uh, This is moderately advanced, and therefore you see cotton wool spots, which are the white spots in the retina, red blotches, which are flame-shaped hemorrhages, as well as seeing the regressed choroidal melanoma along the nasal quadrants. Now, what are the risk factors for radiation maculopathy after plaque radiation therapy for choroidal melanoma? Well, I, I published this paper on the risk factors and found that typically it's the posterior tumors, the tumors that are closer to the macula, that are more likely to get radiation maculopathy. And this is correlated to the amount of radiation delivered to the macula. So it's safe to say that increased foveal dose will be associated with increased risk for radiation maculopathy. You'll see on the bottom that the anterior line is quite low, and we've actually published on radiation of iris and small iridociliary melanomas where there's absolutely no radiation maculopathy that becomes clinically apparent. So how do we predict radiation retinopathy? Well, the American Brachytherapy Guidelines suggest preoperative comparative dosimetry. This tumor you see on the right is subfoveal. The dose that has to go to the tumor is going to be quite high to kill it, and therefore the radiation to the fovea will be quite high, and the risk will be quite, quite high as well. But as I said, there are differences in the forms of radiation that are used and the dose to the base or the dose to that choroid and retina. So it's not uncommon in treatment of macular tumors with ruthenium, for example, where the dose to the base is quite high and a macular scar will develop 
And when you see a macular scar, it's typically associated with decreased visual acuity. Now here's a, a little diagram I put together to help understand the pathogenesis of the vision loss. Early, you have vascular cell loss, and we describe that as decreased numbers of parasites and endothelial cells. First, the parasites drop off, leading to increased vascular permeability and therefore edema. But it also becomes hypoxic, so new blood vessels will grow, written here as neovascularization and shunting of blood vessels. These are all responses to the hypoxia of these blood vessels closing down due to cell loss, due to radiation damage. What happens is you have secondary edema. Secondary edema is associated with vision loss. So early vision loss with radiation is typically edematous or due to macular edema. Later on, other things happen. There is a progressive occlusive vasculopathy that continues. Much like most chronic diseases, radiation retinopathy continues, particularly if it's suppressed and not allowed to become fulminant and, uh, and, and affect vision right away. So we, we use anti-VEGF agents to suppress this process, but still, even with anti-VEGF agents, if you follow patients long enough, you'll see the occlusive vasculopathy as cotton wool spots or capillary dropout, primarily seen on OCTA or fluorescein angiography. This occlusive vasculopathy causes loss of vision like edema, but the edema tends to be early and the occlusive vasculopathy tends to be late. And the timing of early and late is dependent upon treatment. So in general, I developed some prognostic guidelines. If you have a patient that you treated to less than 15 gray, and gray is a measure of radiation, they are unlikely to develop radiation maculopathy. Those patients who have 15 to 25 gray are at small risk and require more regular observation for evidence those who have received 25 to 50 gray are at moderate risk, and almost all the patients who receive greater than 50 gray of radiation will develop radiation maculopathy. So how do we prevent loss of vision or loss of eye? Well, loss of eye sounds very dramatic, but it does happen. If there's enough ischemia in the eye after radiation, Enough VEGF is produced and blood vessels start growing in the iris, causing neovascular glaucoma. And this can result in loss of eye. Now, there's a lot of different new glaucoma techniques to prevent loss of eye, but it's still a risk factor. But let's concentrate on loss of vision. Well, radiation retinopathy starts at the time of radiation or the time of plaque therapy on this slide. And so we have an evolving um, perception of how and when to treat. Our recent results suggest that the earlier treatment winds up suppressing more of the process and allows for longer retention of vision. Early, frequent, and persistent suppressive anti-VEGF therapy preserves vision. Here are a couple of reprints in case you'd like to read about it. So what are the short-term anti-VEGF therapy effects? Well, the first thing you see is decreased retinal edema. Then you see resolution of the retinal hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. Suppression of neovascularization is more difficult to observe because if the neovascularization doesn't happen, it's hard to see it. Uh, there is likely subclinical neovascularization, which will be discovered someday. There's generalized preservation of visual acuity and possibly a delay in that capillary dropout that I previously described. More studies will be needed to prove that. The images you see are of hemorrhages going away. And on the OCT, you see the 
edema going away. And this is a rather rapid thing where in this patient, the vision went from 2040 to 2020 with this anti-VEGF injection treatment of Avastin. Here's another patient. This one was the prior one I showed you with moderately severe radiation maculopathy and a visual acuity here of 2050 prior to treatment. Eight months later, the visual acuity is 2025, and as you see, many if not all of the radiation, clinical radiation retinopathy signs have uh, reabsorbed or disappeared. There are signs of ischemia. You'll see some of the blood vessels are called ghost vessels because they're there, but there's no red blood running through them, particularly on the nasal side of the optic nerve. On the next slide, you'll see another case where we have before anti-VEGF therapy, cystoid macular edema, and a visual acuity of 2050. One year later on periodic intermittent uh, anti-VEGF therapy, we have regressed cystoid macular edema and, and improvement of visual acuity to 2050. This is also seen on the OCT exam. Here's an interesting case. This is one of the first four cases treated with anti-VEGF therapy for radiation maculopathy. I saw her in, uh, in 2005, and in 2007 we have this picture of radiation retinopathy, and then she was treated in 2015. She maintains a 2020 vision. Uh, in this case, the apical radiation dose was 86 gray. The fovea dose was 80 gray, or above that 50 gray mark where she was certain to develop radiation maculopathy. And the optic disc dose was 32, which is below what's commonly seen to cause radiation optic neuropathy. Eight years later, this patient is 2020, due to periodic intravitreal suppression of her radiation maculopathy. Next, we see an example of anterior radiation optic neuropathy suppression. In this case, we caught it early enough so that the edema and the cotton wool spots were relatively um, minor. But you see here, after five years, the patient is still 2016, though there is slight optic disc pallor. As I said before, that the treatment is suppressive and that the vascular occlusions are progressive, and therefore um, you need to continue and counsel patients that it is not a cure, and like most treatments in medicine, it will suppress the disease. In the next slide, you'll see the first patient treated with anti-VEGF th therapy for radiation optic neuropathy. And this was the one that I first saw, almost fell out of my chair, because for the first time in my life, I had seen an, op an optic nerve respond to treatment such that it normalized within three months, as did the visual acuity. This patient was treated for more than eight years and maintained 20-25 vision, but did require continuous periodic treatment. And here's a, uh, the next slide is a subfoveal melanoma, uh, eight and a half years after palladium-103 plaque brachytherapy, also 2025. You'll see that there is uh, neovascularization in the macula, which sometimes requires additional laser therapy in order to maintain uh, the decreased edema um, that this patient is uh, allowed to have due to suppressive anti-VEGF therapy. So radiation vasculopathy progression does occur after even long-term anti-VEGF use. It's not curative. You'll see dilations of retinal blood vessels, uh, macular telangiectasias, exudation of lipids, hemorrhages, and increasing retinal edema no matter what we do. We try polypharmacy, we try switching medications, and we've even tried adding uh, intravitreal steroid for, uh, to augment the effect of the anti-VEGF treatment. All of these things work, but in the end, 
uh, radiation vasculopathy is progressive. So what's my secret for all these wonderful results? It's tight suppression and anti-VEGF dose escalation. Decreasing intervals between the injections from 8 to 6 weeks to 4 weeks. Escalating the doses from, for example, for Avastin from 1.25 to 2.5 milligram, milligrams. I've switched to uh, Lucentis and Ilea. Some patients respond to one drug and don't respond to the other. Uh, I've added intravitreal steroid for what we call polypharmacy. I encourage people to use my classification for radiation retinopathy. It helps you, you counsel your patients as to what the likely outcomes for vision retention may be. And it is helpful for studies where we want to compare our results. So what people often ask me is, what happens if we stop anti-VEGF therapy? Well, in, this is a patient who was 2020, had macular edema and uh, in May of 2010. Then after four years of continuous anti-VEGF suppression, she maintained 2020 vision. And her OCT looks relatively stable. Then six months after voluntarily stopping anti-VEGF injections, her visual acuity declined to finger counting at one foot, and her OCT image is seen on the lower right. I've seen this time and time again when patients either don't come back for their treatment or they've had uh, treat and extend at, uh, in other practices, uh, and in, in the end, it is a chronic disease, much like other chronic diseases we have in medicine, hypertension and diabetes. And it will get worse if people go off their medication or if they don't take their medication as much as they need to. So in conclusion, intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy slows the progression. It suppresses radiation vasculopathy. Dose escalation and switching strategies give patients additional time with vision, and time can be years of vision. Discontinuing anti-VEGF therapy almost always causes relapse. It might not be instantaneous. It could take six months, but eventually the radiation vasculopathy, the edema, and the ischemia will win out, and patients will lose their vision and lose it irreversibly. I thank you for your attention. I want to thank Dr. Tamar for his help with this presentation. And I think you can also go to my website, uh, icancer.com, where I have my results posted so you can see our most recent results in terms of visual acuity uh, after treatment of choroidal melanoma. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me either at pfinger at iCancer.com, that's P-F-I-N-G-E-R at E-Y-E-C-A-N-C-E-R.com. Visit my website or give our office a call at 212-832-8170. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I want to take a moment to thank you for your attention and to thank the iCancer Foundation, who supported much of the research presented in this lecture and for their committed support for international multicenter cooperation in ophthalmic oncology. Thank you, and have a nice day.